All right, let's go ahead and talk nationalism. What is it? Um, nationalism uh, is defined as a common ethnicity, a common language, and a common culture that form a nation. Uh, and so if you can demonstrate that you have your own nationality, i.e. you have your own common ethnicity, your own common language, your own common culture, you can go ahead and just determine how you want to be governed yourself and set up your own nation. Typically, a nation is defined as having a limited government, usually some type of constitution. Uh, oftentimes, in the 1800s, under liberal ideals, those nations are defined uh, by democratic principles, uh, i.e. the right to vote. And uh, groups, nationalist groups, do several things to promote this sense of nation, this sense of nationalism, this sense of loyalty to a government. Uh, it's promoted by wars. It's promoted by public education systems, the spirit of nationalism. Uh, it's promoted by sports and media. Uh, and government policy. Uh, and so there's lots of things that people like Napoleon, Otto von Bismarck, um, Cavour of Italy do to generate this, this feeling of nationalism that, that tries to bind people together um, in a liberal way. Uh, we'll take a look uh, first at the example of Italy. Uh, the Italy nationalist movements uh, really begin in the uh, again mid-1800s uh, and, and it, the first is really uh, this, this movement called Resurgimento. Uh, it means resurgence. And really what they were looking to do here is they were wanting to liberate uh, the Italian states uh, of Parma, Medino, Tuscany, Venetia, um, Lombardy uh, from the control of, um, of, in many cases, Austria uh, or other outside, um, other outside influences like France. And they're wanting to go ahead and unify all these together. Before this, as a result of the Congress of Vienna, all these little states, um, the Papal States, the two Sicilies, uh, they were all separate. Uh, and, and the nationalists wanted to go ahead and combine them. So they wanted to liberate them from foreign influence. They wanted to unify them together as one, in this case, Italy. Uh, these were illegal, uh, these uh, nationalist organizations. So they had to form secret societies, the most notable, the Carbonari. Um, the charcoal burners uh, is what it literally means, uh, because again, uh, the the Austrians, the Pope, the Church didn't want people Italians participating in these organizations. Um, a, a more open uh, nationalist movement comes along a little later. Uh, it's called the Young Italy movement. The nationalists tend to try to appeal to the young and convince the young to come become a part of them. Most of your nationalist movements in the 1800s were movements of young people. Uh, the Young Italy movement is open to all classes, uh, aristocracy uh, and peasants alike. And the idea was to spread the ideals of the Risorgimento. Uh, and, and so again, uh, these are both nationalist movements that really try to promote uh, the, a, a united Italy, a country of Italy, a nation of Italy. Uh, some of the significant leaders of the Italian nationalist movement, uh, Giuseppe uh, Mazzini, he's one of the earliest nationalist leaders. Um, he is a member of the Carbonari. Uh, and he himself uh, goes ahead and um, participates in, in an early rebellion to try to go ahead and unify Italians that sets up the, a republic in the city of Rome from 1848 to 1849, so just one year. And he's one of three guys who, who leads together that republic. And again, a lot of these guys, they weren't looking to start a monarchy here. They were looking to set up a constitutional government, in most cases a republic. Uh, another guy who's a little bit different, uh, Mazzini is really a nationalist in the purest sense of the, form, uh, of the word. But this guy, Camilio Benso de Cavour, he's an aristocrat. He, he's, he's not necessarily one of the common guys. And he becomes the chief minister of the Italian state of Sardinia. Uh, and he supports uh, the king of Sardinia. But he, he has sympathies towards these liberal ideas. And he is certainly a nationalist. He definitely wants to unify all of Italy. Although he's not so sure he wants to go so far as to make a democratic republic. Um, but he does want the idea of all... all um, all Italians uh, unifying together. He, so he supports a lot of liberal and a lot of nationalist goals, even though he himself is an aristocrat. And, and he's really the prime mover and shaker behind the nationalist movement in Italy. He's the guy who pushes it. He's the guy who works behind the scenes to get France involved. He's the guy that pulls the strings, more so than any other of the nationalist leaders in Italy. The last of the nationalist leaders that I just want to address just briefly uh, is Giuseppe Garibaldi. Um, He's the most populist uh, of the leaders, and he was a military leader. Um, he, he unites the two Sicilies and brings them into the fold. And he's one guy that actually uh, Cavour is a little bit hesitant about. He, he knows that if Giuseppe Garibaldi uh, goes ahead and asks, a lot of people will follow him. And he's, 
He's one who, and he did, he, he wanted a republic. He was a nationalist and he was a liberal and he wants to get rid of all this stuff with the monarchs and the kings. Um, and so uh, Cavour basically outmaneuvers him politically and, um, and Garibaldi doesn't achieve the republic that he was hoping for, but he does participate to unify the two Sicilies, southern Italy, with the northern provinces of Lombardy and Tuscany and Parma and Medina and Venetia and Sardinia and eventually the Papal States. Uh, so how does unification occur? Well, there's several events that, that lead to that. There are the revolts of 1848 and 1849, uh, which occur and are largely unsuccessful. They're put down and eventually uh, all the areas that, that broke away uh, get handed back over to the princes or, or, the, the, or Austria or whoever they were taken from. Um, but nonetheless, this really kind of sparks the idea. And so it's really the first event that kind of leads towards unification. Uh, about 10 years later, uh, um, Cavour steps onto the scene and, and he goes ahead and he comes up with an allegiance with France. Uh, he wants to go ahead and fight against Austria to gain uh, some of the, the provinces that Austria controlled. And he says, you know, okay, well, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll split this up with the French. And uh, the French were looking as a way to kind of get some territory from Austria, so it seemed good to them. And so the French go ahead and help out Sardinia. Uh, what the French, Napoleon III, the leader of France, didn't realize was that the Italians would come together and work together. And so they go ahead and they start this war uh, against Austria in 1858. And, man, the Italians are really kind of coming together, and it scares Napoleon III, and he goes ahead and negotiates a secret treaty with Austria real quick to go ahead and end it before Italy can kind of come together. But nonetheless, it's really too late. Uh, the Italians by this time, even though uh, technically Austria remains controlled by by just a few years later, they will go ahead and assert their independence again. They'll kick the Austrians out of every place but Venetia, and, and they'll go ahead and, and vote to come together uh, and, and to form their own country. Uh, in the south, you have the Expedition of the Thousand, led by Garibaldi. And uh, he goes ahead and leads really just a thousand men across the, the island of Sicily and southern Italy and unifies them and then brings them into the fold. And so by 1861, March 17, 1861, King Victor Emmanuel uh, II of Sardinia goes ahead and, and becomes the, the monarch uh, of Italy and in large part because of Cavour and his political dealings. And so you have Sardinia, you have Lombardy, you have Everything but basically Venetia the papal, and the Papal States uh, are now a united Italy. Uh, that changes again in the Seven Weeks War of 1866 where the Italians go ahead and side with the Germans and Austria will have to give up Venetia as a result of losing that Seven Weeks War to Prussia. And, and then finally, the last thing that happens is the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, by this point, the Papal States are still kind of separate. The Pope's not wanting to become part of Italy. And, and But the Franco-Prussian War begins and... Napoleon III, who had French troops in the Vatican to help protect it, realizes he needs help fighting the Prussians, so he pulls those troops out, and when that happens, uh, the Italians rise up, and, and the Papal States, uh, they vote to become part of, of Italy, and Italy is complete after 1870. What we think of as Italy today is, is more or less defined. But they um, immediately encounter problems. The Italians were not used to self-government, so they're plagued by, by corruption, they're plagued by scandal, and on top of that, there's just cultural divides in the country. Even though they're all Italian, they speak Italian, they're ethnically Italian, they're not the same. In, in the north, it's, uh, it's highly industrialized, it's more urban. In the south, it's more rural and agricultural. Uh, and so the two don't always get along. They don't always see eye to eye. And uh, that, that's been a problem in Italy, uh, you know, really till this day. The different regions, sometimes regionalism within the country, even though they're all the same nationality, they don't always agree on everything. And, and that's been something that they've struggled with. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the example of German unification, a little bit different. Uh, in the case of Italy, you have nationalist movements led by liberals. Uh, this is not the case in Germany. German's unification begins with something called the Zollverein. Uh, it's an economic unification uh, where um, they go ahead and, and they, they promote the elimination of tariffs between uh, German territories and, and in Prussia. And this is done to go ahead and expand trade and to, uh, to grow the economy. Uh, the only German state that doesn't really participate, that, and this is Austria. Austria says, no, no, we don't want to do this. Uh, and, and so you get the growth of, of these Germanic states closer and closer to one another because of their economies growing closer and closer to one another. Uh, and, and so that in that way, the Germans go ahead and begin to, to unify themselves and consolidate together. Some of the more significant leaders that, that really uh, draw out of this, uh, by far and away, 
if you want to understand German unification, there's really one guy you need to know, and that's Otto von Bismarck. You need to understand Bismarck. Uh, he is authoritarian. He is referred to, his nickname is the Iron Chancellor. Um, he, he does not like liberals. He, he gets rid of them. He doesn't want democracy. Uh, he wants to run the show, and he does. And he is the one who builds up the Prussian army. He, even after um, you know Napoleon had come through and, and said, oh, you're only allowed to have a small army and, and, and this and that, the Germans figure their way around it and they begin building an army. Otto von Bismarck takes, care, takes advantage of that and, and strengthens the army even more uh, using modern technology. Um, King William the sec, uh, the first, um, again, uh, his big contribution is he appoints Bismarck Chancellor uh, and then gets out of the way. I'm not sure he could stay in the way. Uh, Bismarck was a little bit of a steamroller. Uh, another group and uh, were, were the Junkers. Uh, they were aristocratic landowners. In fact, von Bismarck, uh, Bismarck was a Junker, uh, and they didn't like the high tariffs. They were the, really the primary pushers uh, behind the economic union that led really to the, the modern German state. And so these were guys who, again, for economic reasons, not necessarily cultural reasons or even nationalist reasons, they were wanting to go ahead and, and unify together. So how did this all happen? Well, it really begins, uh, the unification of Germany, with the Danish War of 1864. And, and again, this is Bismarck manipulating the situation. Uh, there are two German territories which were in Danish control, and Bismarck wants them. And so he... he incites a war with the Danish, um, and the Austrians participate, uh, and they gain the territories of uh, Schleswig and Holstein, and they disagree over what should be done. Austria wants them to become a German state and uh, be combined together. Prussia wants control of them, and what ends up happening is Prussia gets uh, Schleswig and Austria gets Holstein, and it stays that way for a couple of years, uh, but Prussia is not satisfied with this, and so a couple of years later, in 1866, you have the Seven Weeks War, and now Prussia will fight Austria for this. Uh, and again, uh, Bismarck in, incites this, provokes the war. He knows he knows how to push the buttons. He gets Austria to declare war, and uh, you know, uh, sure enough, uh, Prussia absolutely dismantles them. This is a shock to everybody. Everybody thought Austria-Hungary was the superpower in Europe. They didn't realize how strong Prussia was becoming. And Prussia uses modern warfare, they use railroads, they use telegraph. And everybody kind of stands up and says, holy smokes, what just happened there? And for the first time, you see the balance of power shifting, whereas Austria had been the leader of the Germanic peoples, now Prussia is. Which kind of makes sense, because really Austria has a lot of different ethnicities in it. It has Italians, it has Austrians, it has Germans, it has Hungarians. Whereas Prussia is really German. It's, it's Germans. They're ethnically German. And, and after the Seven Weeks War, Prussia displaces Austria as the dominant German power on the continent. Prussia is seen as the superpower, not Austria. France, again, because of the dealings of Bismarck, decides to stay neutral in the war. Uh, Italy goes ahead and throws its support uh, behind Germany, and they get Venetia out of it. And Prussia goes ahead and gets Holstein uh, from Austria uh, in the Treaty of Prague. And, and again, Bismarck goes ahead and just lets Austria go and it deals pretty gently with them. The last war that Bismarck uses to go ahead and set up a unified Germany is the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. Again, he manipulates the situation and France declares war on, on Germany. Um, Bismarck does this because he knows it will bring the southern states, which Bismarck does not control yet, into the fold. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so when France invades the southern states of places like Bavaria, uh, uh, will go ahead and decide to come along and become uh, part of the German Empire. Again, the whole thing is precipitated by Bismarck through what's called the Ems Telegram, where he misrepresents how uh, the French ambassador and, and King William had interacted with one another. It makes it sound pretty insulting to the French, and the French go ahead and, and they take the bait and they declare war. And once again, in the period of just a few months, the Prussians absolutely dismantle the French. It leads to the complete collapse of Napoleon III's government in France. Uh, and, and France falls into disarray. They're actually occupied by the German army. They are forced to give up Alsace and part of Lorraine. Uh, they're forced to pay large war indemnities. In other words, they had to pay off a large war debt. Uh, and this was really in response to the Napoleonic Wars. When Napoleon had come through, he didn't want the Prussians to become powerful, so he puts large debts on them. The Prussians are going to pay them back. And so uh, they go ahead and 
they rack it up on the French and they're treating them pretty harshly. And this really sets the stage for the Treaty of Versailles after World War I. Uh, why does that treaty become so harsh? Well, the French remember, and the Germans remembered how Napoleon treated them. Uh, and so it kind of goes back and forth. Um, and so what ends up happening as because of this, because of this nationalist movement? Well, you get the German Empire. Uh, the German Empire uh, forms a government, and, and Bismarck here has to make some concessions. The government that he, he agrees to, um, because of the nature of all the different states coming together, they don't want everybody to be too powerful or anything like that. Uh, it's a lot more democratic than probably Bismarck would have preferred, but he's still able to manipulate the situation. He was a master politician. In the German Empire, you had a couple different legislative uh, bodies. You had the Bundesrat, which was uh, the upper house, and, and they were really where the power was. Uh, then you had the Reichstag, which was the lower house. This was the house that was elected uh, by the people. They didn't get to do much because the chancellor or the Kaiser uh, and the Bundesrat had to go ahead and send stuff to them. But um, every seven years, they got to approve a military budget and propose a military budget. Uh, so that was the Reichstag. The Kaiser, though, was did have absolute power. Uh, to a large degree in the German Empire. The Kaiser was like their emperor. Um, he, and the biggest thing the Kaiser did was he appointed the chancellor. And as soon as the German Empire comes along, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm goes ahead and appoints Otto von Bismarck chancellor. Uh, and the Prussians are dominant in the German Empire. They are the largest German state. They are the most populous German state. Uh, and they become dominant in that German Empire.